Attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the ASHTO Technical Committee on Roadside Safety webinar on the uh, update to the manual for assessing safety hardware. Um, my name is Kelly Hardy. I'm the Program Manager for Safety with ASHTO. Um, we just want to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started with the webinar. Uh, right now, all of the participants are on hold uh, to minimize the background noise we hear. Uh, you can ask questions in the questions box on the control panel for your webinar. And if you entered your audio pin, you can also um, click the raise hand button. And when we get to questions, we can call on you and unmute you so you can ask questions verbally if you'd like. Um, so the audio pin is also listed in your control panel, too. Um, we are recording this webinar, and we'll be able to post it so that uh, we can get um, more people can get the information if they'd like it later on. We also, the technical committee plans on doing a couple more webinars uh, later in the summer as well on the same, <clears throat> same topic. Uh, I'm going to turn over the uh, webinar to our presenters, but first I wanted to let you know who all is participating today. Uh, Joyce Taylor uh, from Maine is the vice chair of the subcommittee on design. Keith Cota from New Hampshire is the chair of the Technical Committee on Roadside Safety. Chris Poole from Iowa is the new vice chair of the Technical Committee on Roadside Safety. And Bernie Cloxon of South Dakota and Paul Fossier of Louisiana are also uh, participating in the webinar. They are technical committee members as well. So uh, Joyce, would you like to take over? Sure, thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. We really appreciate you participating. Um, really, this is an opportunity for the states to um, understand that the work the Technical Committee on Roadside um, Safety has been doing. Um, these folks have been tasked with a lot, a lot of work um, working on a number of different guardrail issues, including the Trinity um, stuff that's been going on, and separate from that, this MASH implementation. Um, so they put a lot of time and effort in. Um, we're asking people on the call to educate themselves about what has been going on and what is proposed. Um, one of the reasons for this update is to um, go over an implementation agreement that, um, that Federal Highway and AASHTO would like to try to sign this year. Federal Highway is very interested in pushing this forward. And I think um, as states, we really need to engage and be part of this conversation. And, and that's what the committee has been doing. Um, also, at the SCO meeting in Cheyenne, um, there was an implementation plan um, that was proposed that has since changed since the SCO meeting. And so I think it's important for people to see that schedule as well. Um, really, um, you know, the perspective beyond the technical issues is that we just aren't seeing the innovation from the manufacturers because there is not a sunset on 350s um, or a requirement for MASH. So um, we're not seeing the safety benefits um, that we were all hoping to see from this. So a big part of the discussion is that um, we've got some balloting coming up this summer. And we felt um, prior to balloting at the Technical Committee for Roadside Safety, it was important to share this information with the states. Um, if the ballots pass at that committee meeting in July, uh, coming up very soon, um, they will, the, God, um, the subcommittee on design is going to be asked in September to vote on two ballots involving NASH. Um, and unfortunately, the timing is such this year that God literally is at the same time uh, as the beginning of the SCO meeting. So, there's still discussion whether or not SCO will be able to ballot at their meeting. Um, I encourage you to really have some conversations within your state around this issue um, to make sure that everybody is on the same page in your state and really just kind of ask questions and get as much information as you can about um, this proposal. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Keith Cota from New Hampshire, who is the chair of the technical committee. Here you go, Keith. Thank you very much, Joyce. Um, the, uh, certainly, as part of the introduction, we're, we're going to be uh, trying to go through the, uh, the reasons for the update, perspectives uh, as to the technical aspects of the updates, and the uh, impetus behind the uh, various committees that we've, we work on, especially the implementation agreement. Uh, Kelly, I'm sorry, but I don't think I have control of the slides. I advance it. I'll work on it. Okay. Um, crash test. Um, 
it's wonderful. It certainly, it's a good opportunity for us to provide a, a an overview of of the crash testing procedures. We felt that'd be important to start out with a little bit of a history lesson as to the what was the past crash test uh, approaches. Um, crash testing actually has been in existence since earlier than 1962. Um, I'm sure you may have seen some old videos of a 1930 antique car running down a driveway and and, and smashing into the first cable guardrail systems. So it's been in existence since the 1930s and 40s. It's been a strong interest. Uh, the first real publication occurred in 1962 with the uh, Circular 482. So it was a, a one-page document that basically outlined a 4,000-pound car with a 60 mile per hour and then 7 and 25 degree angle impacts. And its uh, objective was to achieve tolerable lateral decelerations. Um, since then, um, in 1973, the NCHRP Report 153, which consisted of 16 pages, and began to outline uh, different weights of the vehicles. Uh, we started going in with a 2,200-pound uh, car as well as a 4,500-pound car, and 20 to 60 miles per hour, and 15 to 25 degree Im impact angles. Um, and um, then it, we. Uh, moved forward into 1978 with the Circular 191 actually was a single page and it just clarified the discussions on soils, test vehicles, uh, uh, the evaluation criteria itself. The biggest change occurred in 1980 and that was with the adoption of the NCHRP Report 230. Um, this was a 36 page document but it brought forward the 1800 and 4500 pound cars um, it also brought forward the lower speed 20 mile per hour and 60 mile per hour impacts uh, as well maintaining the 15 and 25 degree angle impacts. Um, it uh, also started to expand into the vehicles, the hardware and some test matrices. In 1993 though, uh, we ended up updating through a panel, NCHRP panel work, uh, Report 350. And that was the workhorse for, for several years, of course. That one was a 64-page document, but it began to bring in the test levels, the test conditions. Uh, brings in the 80,000-pound uh, um, tractor trailer. It brought in the uh, pickup truck uh, as, a, as a test condition, test specific, a specification for vehicles. Um, and, uh, and it also began to draw in the uh, incremental speeds changes of 31 miles per hour, 43 and 62 miles per hour for test level 1, 2 and as well as test level 3 as well as maintaining the degree of 20 degree and 25 degree angle impacts for critical impact angles. That, that uh, guidance certainly served us for many years um, until 2009 we basically started looking at the uh, guidance itself and and uh, uh, came forward with the Manual of Assessing Safety Hardware, what we refer to as MASH. Um, the, uh, under that conditions, of course, we were still looking at the worst practical conditions for testing, uh, as well as the state of the art uh, components. It's important to note how these crash test procedures have influenced our national road, roadway safety uh, guidance. This crash test uh, criteria that we have has been fully integrated into the updates of the roadside design guide that is under the uh, under the oversight of the Technical Committee for Roadside Safety. The RDG gives transportation agencies the best toolbox of road safe, roadside safety hardware and guidance as to its use. The manufacturer, the system classifications, the, the crash test levels, the system dimensions, the deflections that we see from the crash testing, the uh, vehicle overhang, what we call the zone of intrusions, as well as reference to the federal eligibility letters. Uh, this is all critical and key information for the roadside designers as they, as they implement the roadside design guide into their projects. The improved crash tests under assessment standards are critical to employing the most functional and crash-worthy systems for the particular roadway and bridge application as outlined in the roadside design guide. MASH 2009 was accompanied with a AASHTO Federal Highway Implementation Agreement uh, that, given, that provided guidance and direction as to implementation of the, of the update these, uh, testing criteria. It was recognized that the systems developed under 350 have served our needs well and there was no need to move to a wholesale shift like we experienced between NCHRP 350, uh, 230 and 350. Uh, and uh, it also allows us time, provide time for the road safety road safety industry to upgrade your systems to the MASH system. 
MASH criteria. Next slide. In the early 1990, uh, through an NCHRP panel development, the update of the of the uh, 230 was completed, and this is kind of an overview of, of the changes between 230 to 350. That that was pretty pretty significant. Uh, this change was considered to be a huge leap toward improving our understanding of real world conditions to a better understanding of vehicle types, to include the 4,000 uh, pound pickup truck as well as the 17,000 pound single unit. Uh, truck, as well as bring in the 80,000 pound tractor trailer uh, for the higher test level, test level 5, uh, as well as developed test levels for certain speed conditions, the 45 mile per hour, lower than 45, as well as higher than 45. MASH 2009 crash test manual was the first publication as an AASHTO document. The, the changes from NCHRP 350 to MASH included modifications to the test matrices, test installations, and update on vehicle specifications. Um, it also included more defined evaluation criteria, documentation requirements, as well as a recommended in-service performance process and evaluation process. These adjustments were considered an improvement over NCHRP 350. However, the TCRS Roadside, roadside safety researchers as well as the industry experts agree that the benefits and safety performance of systems under NCHRP 350 did not require a wholesale adjustment um, with the implementation of MASH 2009. Over the next five to seven years, it was expected that the industry would likely bring new and improved systems forward under MASH 2009 to allow for continued improvement in the roadside safety hardware uh, performance. Some of the, some of the two, 350 to mass changes under the test matrices conditions were the small car angle impact was changed from 25 degrees, 20 degrees to 25 degrees. Uh, impact speed of the single unit truck was slightly increased from 50 miles per hour to 56 miles per hour. Occupant risk in, uh, of length of need test was, was implemented. Im uh, impact angle for terminals and crash cushions was changed from 20 to 25 degrees. Uh, gating terminals uh, was reduced, uh, angle was uh, reduced from 15 degrees to 5 degree angle impacts. The mid-sized car was added, uh, especially for the stage impact attenuation devices. Barrier testing heights was also required for testing. We wanted to be able to test what the maximum height for a small vehicle uh, impact for a longitudinal barrier as well as the minimum height for a pickup because um, you certainly can understand the bumper, bumper elevations of those two vehicles are significantly different. The critical impact points for terminals and redirective crash cushions. The uh, uh, um, critical impact point for reverse direction impacts was also brought forward. TMA option test was become mandatory. Um, the, uh, certainly we wanted to define what the maximum minimum weight of a truck, truck weight was required for that type of TMA, as well as the ballasting and shifting within the vehicle under the braking or non-braking system. The variable message signs and aero uh, board trailers was also brought forward as, as a need for crash testing. Um, longitudinal channelized barricades um, was also brought forward as a test matrix. And we also wanted to be able to utilize the electronic data recorders within the test vehicles to see how they accelerated and decelerated within the, uh, within the test variations. Test uh, installations are also a little bit adjusted. We want to know what the soil conditions of the test application uh, application was. We also wanted to know what the embedment of post, um, and we also wanted to know what components, critical components the system has, as well as the installation uh, lengths, uh, documentation as to the installation lengths. The test vehicle specifications, um, we are looking at the uh, test vehicles to really to be the second and the 90th percentile heaviest weight for a small car, which come out to be about the Rio Kia, as well as a pickup. Um, and the, uh, we wanted to be the 90% of the highest, heaviest weight for the pickup, and that resulted into the Chevy Silverado or Dodge Ram as being a critical uh, test vehicle for a truck. It was a four-door quad cab system, and it was anticipated that that those two vehicles uh, would be more representative of the of the truck fleet that we have on the roadways, as well as representative of the SUV 
fleet that we have on the on in the market. The evaluation criteria was also changed. We're looking at occupant risk. We're looking at windshield damage. Uh, we're also looking at the occupant compartment damage. Um, and we're also changed the marginal pass to either it passed or it failed. There's no marginal now. Uh, we also looked at the maximum roll roll angle, uh, whether the uh, uh, the pitch had of the vehicle had to be less than 75 degrees. And we're also looking at the exit condition. What was the exit box criteria? Where did the vehicle end up after the crash event occurred? Um, also, the vehicle rebound on crash cushions. Test documentations was more in lines of, of dealing with the more modern technology that we have. We're looking for CAD drawings, AutoCAD, MicroStation files, so we can more represent that information quicker. We're also for looking for more improved test reports um, and uh, more detailed documentation of the, of the test results itself. The, um, if you look at the vehicle conditions between 350 to MASH 2009, um, you'll see that, the, that what we found through our review of the vehicles that are using our roadways um, systems, that the small vehicle weight is actually increased. It increased from 1,800 pounds to about 2,400 pounds. The, we also saw the pickup truck significantly changed uh, weight from uh, 4,500 pounds to 5,000, but the bigger change was the height, the center of gravity height. The, uh, our pickup trucks today are certainly uh, much higher uh, bumper height wise than what we've been seeing under the crash test vehicles of the of, uh, 350 uh, systems. The vehicle age was also a critical point that we wanted to make sure that we have vehicles that are, are more in line of what we're actually driving the roadway systems. Uh, we get into the uh, single unit truck. Uh, single unit truck, we were looking at adding the additional weight within the truck to 10,000, uh, uh, 22,000 pounds uh, system. And, um, and then the tractor trailer under the changes between 350 to MASH really has not changed uh, too greatly at this point. Um, the longitudinal barrier impact conditions. Um, the, the categories for test levels basically include the test level three for small car, 62 miles per hour, still the same, 25 degree angle. Um, TL3 for pickup, it's pretty much the same, same crash test uh, impact conditions. TL4, slightly increase in speed, uh, but the angle still remains the same. And then a TL5, the tractor trailer, was, was basically unchanged. One of, the, one of the interesting facts that came forward relative to a review of, of impact uh, um, forces that the TL3 uh, impact by a pickup truck on a system versus the TL4 that the actual impact loading, if you look at it from a square square inch point of view, was actually less, and, and uh, which re really resulted in a re-review re -review of the TL4 crash test and an, an increase in the speed slightly so that we have a, a more representative impact, impact forces. Besides the impact angle for terminals, um, for certainly the 25 degree angle, of, as well as for the length of need, with the five degree gating test, um, as as in, with the inclusion of the uh, intermediate test vehicle, which was a, a 1500 pound sedan, uh, testing on sign supports and work zone uh, devices um, to include the pickup, because previously it was just under the small car. Um, and then we also were uh, including barrier heights. We wanted to know what the barrier heights were, the maximum and, and minimum, the critical point impacts of the, of the system for a reverse direction impact. Uh, TMA options, as I noted previously, the, the maximum minimum truck weight as well as the ballasting and the vehicle braking in the system that was tested under. The support structures and work zone control devices, um, we're certainly looking to uh, add the small vehicle testing criteria for uh, to add to that the truck light truck test into that. Um, and then of course the EDA or EDA uh, reporting uh, capabilities. Modifications to evaluation of the criteria. The uh, general changes here is the occupant risk. We wanted to be modify the calculations to, uh, for occupant impact velocity when what is the ride down acceleration within the vehicle, especially as it's yawing and, and comes to a stop. What is the forces within that vehicle for that occupant's risk? Windshield damage um, provides a more quantitative criteria. Um, 
and uh, to look at the structural support of the, of the systems, especially for work zone devices, as the as the uh, vehicle crashes into them and they come over and and have uh, roof roof impacts. The uh, vehicle rebound and crash cushions. We want to know what we want to know what that rebound capabilities of those systems are. How far that vehicle come back. Um, the vehicle, uh, the vehicle's exit box conditions was another um, item that we wanted to have documented as part of the evaluation criteria. In-service evaluations um, was also included in the in the uh, uh, MASH 2009, but as a recommended option uh, of of evaluating systems that are actually in service. It encouraged in-service evaluation to demonstrate the safety, the satisfactory field performances. Uh, we certainly expect the potential of pool fund resources between states looking at proprietary device manufacturers, uh, disseminating information through uh, the possible channels like the National Technical Information, uh, NHTSA, uh, as well as the Federal Highway Regional Resource. We're pooling that information that we gather and so that all states will benefit from it. And also to consider the establishment of a new national um, center on in-service evaluation. Um, these were these were elements within the MASH 2009. Uh, excuse me, yes, 2009. Um, but we also recognize the the importance of in-service evaluations for roadside safety hardware in disseminating that information through a national organization. Under the NCHRP panel overview for the uh, NCHRP 2214. Uh, uh, PRIN2 as well as PRIN3, crash testing was done on each roadside safety class of, system, class of systems, the log and tuna barriers, the transition uh, terminals, as well as bridge rails. And the purpose was to see how our current toolbox of roadside safety systems would perform under the pending guidance of MASH 2009. Uh, some of the tests involved the strong post W beam system. Uh, you probably recognize that as being our old workhorse uh, log and tuna barrier system. And we also crash tested the Midwest guardrail system. This was a new system being developed by the pool fund states in, in the Midwest. Uh, we looked at New Jersey uh, shaped concrete barrier for test level three. We also looked at F shaped uh, temporary concrete barrier and three loop connection, uh, the, uh, I, and as well as an IO transition, tangent guardrail terminal system. And then we also looked at the New Jersey shaped concrete barrier, 32 inch tall under the uh, under TL4. Um, as I note here, that that system failed under that under that crash test. The uh, strong post W beam, the work uh, wood post with a wood block out, um, was crash tested uh, with the pickup, the Chevy Silverado for test level three under MASH, and it did not pass. Uh, but was a subsequent test was made with the uh, strong post W beam steel post guardrail with a wood block out, and that. That uh, system did pass with the Dodge Ram under the test level three uh, conditions under match. What it really came to light is that our old workhorse strong post W beam guardrail system has reached its level of, of, of effective uh, uh, performance and that we really need to transition to an improved system. The uh, 32 inch New Jersey concrete barrier, as I noted earlier, failed under the TL4 on the redirective. Um, since uh, 2009, with the adoption of MASH, TCRS sought research projects through NCHRP program to undertake in-service evaluations to studies to see how our road, the roadside safety hardware is functioning and to see if there are any other real-world issues with these systems and devices. Unfortunately, we were not able to, we were not able to obtain funding that allowed us to undertake intensive uh, in-service evaluations. Under the... Um, Silverado crash test, 27-inch W-beam strong post uh, guardrail long tunnel barrier with wood post. This is at a 25-degree angle impact at 62 miles per hour. This is the beginning of the impact of the of the pickup into the system. As you can see here, the vehicle continues and penetrates through the guardrail system and ultimately ends up in a rollover condition, and uh, which is certainly a failed test. Um, as I got, like I noted earlier, subsequently test with a Dodge Ram pickup with a strong post W beam post with steel passed and and uh, and did provide for redirective, and uh, it was a near rollover, but it did pass the test. 
here's a uh, couple pictures of the of the 32 inch New Jersey concrete barrier uh, under the uh, test level four for the single unit truck. Um, the uh, previously the system certainly was was acceptable under the pickup as well as small car for test level three, but it was too short under this condition for the uh, higher center of gravity uh, for the single unit truck. As you can see here, the effect of this is the vehicle was not redirected. It started rotating over the barrier and coming and coming onto its side, which is considered a failed test under the uh, under the uh, uh, MASH 2009. Subsequent to this test. <laughs> Excuse me. Texas DOT actually sponsored tests review, um, for for test level four conditions under MASH, and they tested a concrete barrier system to a 36 inch tall uh, system, and it was successfully successfully redirected the, the truck without uh, rollover like this. Uh, so we we understand that that the 32 inch is too short, and 36 inch appears to be the mac the the minimum height that we need in order to maintain a test level four impact condition. As I noted earlier, uh, the Midwest pool fund states were, de were developing a new and improved longitudinal guardrail, guardrail system about the same time as we're looking at MASH, uh, as MASH 2009, uh, and it's rightfully named the Midwest Guardrail System, the MGS. This system was a 31 inch tall mid splice with a 12 as well as or as well as a uh, optional 8-inch blockouts, wood or composite uh, blockouts, and also steel or wood posts. The crash testing was done under MASH 2009 was very positive and provided an alternative to the old workhorse WB and guardrail uh, steel post system that we had. As you can see here, the redirection of the, of the vehicle was very smooth through the whole system. The redirection was about three feet of deflection with minimal roll. It's a non-proprietary system, and based upon the September of 2014 uh, poll of state agencies, the adoption of 31-inch MGS was uh, over 50% of the states have adopted and, and moving forward with the 31-inch uh, MGS as their standard system. Um, and we also understand there's about 20% of the states that are still have not considered moving toward that that new. A non proprietary system. MASH to 2009 uh, to MASH 2015. Now, this is where we're, we're beginning to transition from MASH 2009 and, and looking at the, uh, uh, the newer, newer criteria. In, uh, the TCS identified a number of areas providing improved guidance and to address the highway agency's desire to place barriers on slopes, mostly cable systems. The largest change between MASH 2009 to 2012 if we adopt it, is the crash testing criteria on slopes. This remains an industry initiative to allow a defined criteria for crash testing of their systems as they place them on different slope uh, variations and very uh, conditions. The uh, TCS also identified the need to increase the length of the tractor trailers for the TL5 due to the industry changes to the longer, longer trailers. The uh, TCRS also found through the discussions with our testing facilities that the tolerance levels for the single unit truck as well as tractor trailers were too tight and need to be adjusted. That basically reference, references the angle and speed tolerances allowances that we would provide uh, for. Prior to crash testing, um, we were looking at the uh, need to report on the strength of the soils. The, um, the, as you can see here, we're looking at a dynamic force uh, measurement. Um, we're looking at the loaded cell post, or uh, the test and facilities can actually put accelerometers on the post for measuring the force measurements as well as distance measurements. We also are looking at the strength measurement, changing the, the dynamic impact for strength so that the, the depending upon the movement of the post, 5 inches, 10 inches, 15 inches, 20 inches, would have a certain minimum energy dissipation. The location of the post, uh, where is it basically on, on, on uh, level terrain, um, the, as well as the soil gradation. This is all key information, and if the system is dependent upon it, we want to make sure that we give that information to the users. Mass changes for uh, cable barrier and ditch section, uh, median ditch. Again, this is the, the really big emphasis behind the 2000, uh, 
um, 15 uh, update for MASH. Um, and it basically looks at different test conditions, test positions uh, for different types of vehicles on slopes, whether it's a four slope, the back slope, we're looking at the, the key evaluation matrices for, for those slope conditions. Um, under this development of the system, certainly we ran some, some uh, tests to see how these vehicles would run down these slopes as well as back up the slopes so we can see if there's some consistency b b being provided in this. Um, and uh, this is the, the crash test criteria that we want to bring forward under the new MASH update. Additional MASH changes, we're looking at the uh, update um, for the hood height measurements. We want to know what the height of the uh, hood is. Um, we're finding that they, there are quite uh, a variations in different vehicles. The trailer tractor trailer length uh, going from 50 feet to 53 feet. Um, with a uh, tolerance of, of, of plus or minus two inches. The uh, single unit truck cargo bed uh, pretty much is is slight decrease in that, uh, but the bigger, the, not the bigger, but the other change is the impact severity tolerances. Um, and what we're finding is that under the TL4 and TL5, we need to reduce or, or um, allow for a little bit additional allowances under those test conditions. Now we'll get into the MASH implementation plan, and I will turn it turn it um, um, the uh, sorry the MASH implementation plan. Um, the as, as of January 2011, all new. Oops, sorry. I need to turn this over to to my cohort. All right. Thank you, Keith. Um, before we get into the proposed MASH implementation plan, um, we felt it was important to kind of touch upon a couple points on the current implementation plan uh, that was established in 2009. Next slide, please. OK. so. The 2009 implementation agreement stated that uh, as of January 1, 2011, all newly developed hardware must be tested using the new MASH requirements. And basically, this just meant that Federal Highway Administration would not issue any new eligibility letters after that date for NCHRP 350 devices. Also, uh, NCHRP 350 compliant hardware did not have to be retested to the new MASH requirements. However, as Keith pointed out, especially under a particular NTHRP project, that was actually done. Um, and then NTHRP 350 compliant hardware may remain in place and continue to be installed. However, non-compliant hardware with no suitable alternatives may be left in place and continue to be installed. Next slide. So allowing both NCHRP 350 and the new MASH compliant devices to be installed together was considered a parallel approach. There was really no necessity and no incentive for manufacturers to develop new systems. So the parallel approach, it was supposed to allow manufacturers time to develop new products. However, almost four years or over four years later now, very few proprietary MASH systems have been developed. So unfortunately, the additional safety benefits afforded to us with MASH can only be realized if new hardware is developed and installed on our roadways. Sunsetting 350 would provide the incentive necessary to get additional MASH systems tested and approved. So. Several months ago, back at the beginning of the year, a joint Federal Highway, AASHTO, and TCRS group was formed to review and update the joint AASHTO Federal Highway MASH implementation agreement in concert with the proposed update to MASH that should be occurring yet this year. Next slide. So the proposed implementation agreement 
um, just as a clarification, does only apply to the national highway system. And this is just as with the previous implementation agreement from 2009. And just to clarify, TCRS will continue to develop and maintain the evaluation criteria, which is MASH, and the Federal Highway Administration will continue reviewing and determining eligibility of highway safety hard hardware on federal aid projects. Next slide. So the specifics of the new implementation agreement, the proposed implementation agreement, are as follows. All NCHRP 350 or MASH 2009 compliant permanent hardware may remain in place unless damaged re beyond repair. Existing 350 or MASH 2009 compliant temporary devices, including portable concrete barrier, may continue to be used through their normal service lives. Any revision to 350 compliant hardware must utilize MASH 2015 for reevaluation and retesting once the new MASH document has been approved. Next slide. As I just stated, uh, upon adoption of MASH 2015, any newly developed hardware must utilize MASH 2015 for evaluation and testing. And as of January 1st, 2017, the Federal Highway Administration will no longer issue eligibility letters for new or revised hardware under MASH 2009 criteria. Next slide. Continuing, continuing with the specifics of the proposed implementation agreement, the utilization of 2015 MASH compliant hardware will be required on new construction and reconstruction projects by the following dates. January 1st of 2018, all longitudinal W-beam barrier and cast-in-place concrete barrier. January 1st, 2019 would be all cable barrier, transition units, terminals, crash cushions, and bridge railings. January 1st of 2020, precast concrete barriers, sign supports, other breakaway hardware, and all other longitudinal barriers. Now, non-MASH 2015 temporary work zone devices will not be allowed to be manufactured after January 1st, 2020. However, NCHRP 350 or 2009 MASH compliant temporary work zone devices may continue to be used throughout their normal service lives after that date. Next slide. Finally, the, uh, the proposed implementation agreement urges agencies to upgrade non-NCHRP 350 compliant hardware, especially when it's damaged beyond repair. Now, these are the systems, um, I guess what comes to mind usually is a blunt end terminal uh, or a, say a BCT guardrail end terminal, those devices which haven't even passed NCHRP 350 uh, testing. Also, uh, the proposed implementation agreement encourages agencies to upgrade non-MASH 2015 compliant hardware when related project work requires new installation of safety hardware, replacement of existing safety hardware, or modification of an existing barrier or system to improve safety performance in accordance with an individual agency's policies. At this point, I'll hand it back to Keith Cota. Keith, is your phone line muted? That might help. Um, sorry, the uh, timeline here, the uh, TCRS certainly has a, an interest in moving MASH forward this summer, uh, as well as implementation agreement to be approved uh, for this year. The uh, push for MASH certainly has been a, a um, interest by the cable guardrail industry, uh, seeking the uh, guidance as to how to crash test 
uh, on slopes so they can begin to invest in their systems and, and give us better understanding as to the as to those criteria. The um, based upon discussions from ASHTO as well as Federal Highway leadership, uh, there's a desire to update the implementation plan and to uh, push forward the manageable implementation of MASH and sunsetting of NCHRP 350, uh, as Chris has outlined. The balloting process, uh, TCRS is, is expected to ballot at our annual meeting, uh, which is actually scheduled for next week in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, we, we're hoping to be able to uh, ballot the MASH um, document itself for the changes, as well as implementation agreement. Uh, upon the uh, TCRS balloting, we will be moving it forward to the uh, uh, subcommittee on design um, to uh, begin to ballot ballot the um, through that organization. Um, and um, I understand that maybe certainly is going to be a point of discussion on the agenda for the September 2015 annual meeting in Seattle, Washington. Uh, Joyce, I'm not sure if you want to add anything else at this point. Right. The um, meeting is in September in Seattle, Washington. We really urge states. Um, this is a very important topic. It's a. It's really, um, I think, one of the more um, um, things that's, that probably um, will will really present real change. And so it's important if you can send somebody. I also think it's important um, to know what your agency is thinking. And you know, we want this to be um, successful, so you need to weigh in now during these webinars and to make yourself heard now. Um, so we're hoping to be able to ballot in Seattle um, if we're ready to do so. Um, depending on how that ballot goes, as I said earlier, we may or may not bring it to the SCO meeting. Unfortunately, again, the timing is such the meetings overlap, and um, typically we would want to give our um, subcommittee members on design an opportunity to talk to their chief engineers before they went to SCO. Um, so we're, we're trying to figure that out. We'll be seeking guidance from um, the SCO leadership on that. Um, so that is the plan for right now. But part of that plan involves folks who are on the call now um, and continue to be on calls this summer voicing their thoughts and, and concerns and, and you know really having a conversation. So back to you, Keith. Thank you, Joyce. The um, uh, Kelly, you're going to move through the next next set of slides. Now, in advance of the uh, webinar, uh, we also provided a a, uh, a background on the Ashto Federal Highway Joint Agreement and the Manual uh, Assessment for Safety Hardware. Um, in that, we provided a series of, of frequently asked questions, and we just kind of like to go over some of these elements right now. Um, the agreement, um, uh, what roads would this agreement apply? As, as um, Chris has outlined, um, the agreement itself, when approved by Federal Highway and ASHTO, is intended to apply to the national highway system. Through the uh, individual highway agencies, um, they are strongly encouraged to require the use of hardware that meets the ma updated match on all other roads as well. The Intermod Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act of, of 1991 stated that the FHWA standards apply to the National Highway. Therefore, FHWA's participation in this joint agreement, agreement uh, plan is re related to the NHS system. As state standards apply uh, for off the NHS system, states may choose to apply this implementation agreement to their standards and use on the non-NHS systems. Uh, safety benefits for the MASH hardware would, would not vary based upon what road you own. Uh, please keep in mind, a vehicle traveling the same speed on an NHS, NHS system, uh, as well as on the non-NHS system, uh, performs the same way when impacting your roadside safety hardware. So it, it's certainly beneficial to look at the uh, application of this throughout your whole network. What types of projects would this agreement apply? The agreement would apply when the new safety hardware is being installed. It would also apply when modifying an existing barrier run or system to improve the safety performance in accordance with the individual agency's policies. Could become This element could become a future element of each of the state stewardship agreements uh, that they have with their division office of Federal Highway. The, uh, through a very, um, what are the expected safety benefits of implementing MASH 2015? 
to a, a relatively small number of MASH 2000 devices are in use, uh, the crash test demonstrations improve safety performance over the NCHRP 350 devices. Uh, and certainly has been detailed in the background paper that has been supplied to you. I'd like to turn this over now to uh, um, Paul to answer the next set of questions. Uh, this is Paul Fossier. I'm ASHTO TCRS member. I'm with the Louisiana DOTD. And also, I'm a member of the ASHTO Subcommittee on Bridges and Structures. I also uh, am a liaison between TCRS and the Bridge Subcommittee. The Bridge Subcommittee also has a, a technical committee for bridge rail and guardrail. Uh, these next questions, uh, the first one, what are the expected costs of MASH 2015 compliant hardware? Uh, several states have reported initially higher costs for the end treatments that meet MASH 2009 criteria, though there is expected to be a higher level of performance. Uh, it's also expected that as more devices, MASH devices are brought into the market, the competitive nature of the industry will minimize the cost impact. Bridge railing will likely see the biggest cost differential due to the integration of the bridge and uh, the rails and the bridge deck to account for the increased forces imposed upon MASH. So uh, not only the bridge rail costs, but the actual design of the cantilever decks, the cantilever portion of the bridge decks may see some increases due to the thickness of the deck uh, and the reinforcement. What, are the, what devices currently meet MASH 2009 criteria? Uh, list of devices that have been successfully tested the MASH 2009 criteria will be provided to everyone. And I think we have that list available and uh, we can discuss that a little bit later, but they'll may, be made available to everyone. Will devices meeting 2000, uh, MASH 2009 be retested in MASH 2015? Uh, the updates to MASH only affect specific types of devices, not all devices. Cable median barrier will need to be tested using the new criteria for slope medians. Other hardware that meet MASH 2009 criteria for which the test criteria are not changing will not need to be retested in order to meet MASH 2015 criteria. Uh, the next the set of questions, uh, Bernie Cloxton will take over. Thanks, Paul. This is Bernie Cloxton, South Dakota DOT. I've been a member of uh, ASHO TCRS for a number of years. Um, question number seven, why are these specific sunset dates proposed? Well, because of crash test research on generic longitudinal, longitudinal barriers such as MGS has progressed through pool fund efforts these systems can be implemented prop promptly. Um, the other generic features as well as most proprietary safety devices have not seen extensive crash testing under MASH, such as a lot of the, the work zone devices. Therefore, testing of the devices and incorporating new hardware into state standards will take longer for those. Um, question number eight, um, can finite ele element analysis still be used? This is in regards to um, uh, getting the eligibility letter uh, approved for minor changes. Um, you can use finite element analysis. It can continue to be used to evaluate minor changes to hardware that has been fully cra crash tested under MASH. Um, question number nine. After the sunset dates, will highway agencies still be able to obtain replacement parts for hardware that meets NCHRP 350 or MASH 2009? It is expected that the manufacturers will continue to make replacement parts. And I guess the next set of questions, Chris Poole. Yeah. Uh Question number 10, how is damaged beyond repair defined and how is normal service life defined? Um, really there's no official definition for either of these terms. We would expect that each highway agency establishes their own criteria that define when permanent and temporary hardware should be replaced. However, um, I should point out that NCHRP report 656 
criteria for restoration of longitudinal barriers could be a resource for agencies to use, uh, especially for permanent devices. And then for temporary devices, um, the quality guidelines for temporary traffic control devices and features published by ATSA would be a good resource, uh, resource for those temporary devices to determine uh, normal service life. Number 11, will crash test facilities have the capacity to perform MASH tests on all of the devices that manufacturers will develop in time for the sunset dates? So based on informal discussions that we've had with the staff of some of the crash test facilities and others in the roadside safety community, it is expected that the test facilities will have the capacity for the new tests. A bigger challenge may be identifying funding sources for testing, especially of non-proprietary devices, through NCHRP and pooled fund programs, or for individual states to test any unique designs that they may use. As this process takes time, it will be necessary to begin identifying funding for testing as soon as possible. And number 12, when future updates to MASH are approved and published, how will sunset dates be handled for hardware meeting previous versions of the test criteria? So just as we're doing now with this proposed update to the MASH crash testing guidance for 2015, uh, any future revisions as they're being developed uh, we would evaluate the impact of the changes and we would put together a group and uh, consider an update to an implementation plan to adjust for the, any changes that might occur. I think that um, finishes up the FAQ portion. So we do, um, this is Kelly Hardy again, we do have a couple questions that came in through the um, you know, questions box on your webinar control panel. So Keith, we'll just, um, I'll, we'll, we'll read those off to you and you, um, you and the others on the committee can address them. Sounds the good. The first question was actually about the, a um, couple people asked if the slides would be available from today's webinar and we will take the slides and send them out to the uh, registrar, the people who registered for the webinar, and um, that, then you know, feel free to share them. If you want to, we'll also send the link to the recording as well. So um, if you want the, to pass that link on to others who might not have been able to attend. Um, the next, Keith, the Keith, first slide for you, um, sorry, first question for you, is a question about related to MASH compliant devices on new construction and reconstruction projects. Uh, does that refer to the time of installation or the time the project is let or awarded? At what point do you need to start using the MASH 2015 devices? The, uh, I guess the, the way to answer that question is, is it's still going to fall within the, the agency's policy and guidance criteria. Um, the, um, we're looking, certainly looking to have the best systems uh, utilized uh, to the, to the, as fast as is available. We know that, that um, we have a very limited, some limited supplies as to the MASH crash test uh, systems. We do have some alternatives. We will provide, be providing a list of what those options are. If there's options that are out there that are under the MASH crash test that you can implement, it really is going to fall under the state's state's criteria, um, and you know certainly by a, a the date that we have outlined in the sunset uh, agreement that for new installations uh, we certainly were looking looking to uh, uh, have the states basically bring forward the best performing devices that we can uh, for for the for the roadway systems. Okay. Thank you. Um, there was another question about the normal service life of temporary traffic control devices, but um, that was discussed. So um, if there's any additional questions related to that, please just um, send it back into the question box or um, raise your hand. Uh, the next question, Keith, is uh, along with cable being tested for various slopes, is there an expectation that other 
longitudinal barriers will be tested for various slopes as well. Very good question. Um, the criteria that we have established in MASH 2015, the new update, is to look at crash testing of longitudinal barriers on slopes. Uh, we understand that there's a strong interest in the cable cable industry for that, but it does not prohibit that other systems could be looked at and crash tested on slopes using that same same uh, criteria. Okay, the next question: uh, How is testing to be performed uh, performed on terminals that are flared well back from the shoulder? Under the uh, MASH criteria, even the current MASH 2009, it does spell out basically the, the layout of the system. And if the system is being crash tested uh, parallel to the roadway or it's being crash tested on a, on a taper, then that will be part of the reporting criteria under, under the crash test, crash testing for, that, for, those facility, for those systems. Okay, uh, along with the list of MASH approved systems being sent, could a similar list for 350 approved systems be sent? So um, we have um, we have a, we, I think we can find something to direct people to when we send that out. Yeah, just to just uh, um, add on to that, certainly under the um, current document for the roadside design guide, the 2011, it certainly has a listing of systems that have been crash tested under 350. Um, is there any new systems? We certainly can look at see if there's any new systems since the publication in 2011. But I believe most of the systems are identified in the roadside design guide. Um, okay, the next one, does the state or FHW FHWA Division Office makes a call on damaged beyond repair. As uh, Chris has noted in, in answering one of the questions, um, um, the call as to how it's determined a system is damaged beyond repair will f fall upon the each state agency or highway agency making that determination. Um, and that certainly is, is in accordance to their own policies and their own guidance. Okay, next question. Will the LRFD bridge spec be giving guidelines for new design of the deck cantilevers? Uh, this is Paul Fossier. Uh, currently, the ASHTO Technical Committee T7 in SCOBS is working on that issue. Uh, primarily there's a table listed in uh, the bridge railing chapter in the uh, ASHTO LRFD specifications that T7 is currently trying to update. Um, so we are working on it, but it hasn't been completed yet. All right, the next uh, question, Paul, is related to bridges. If you could maybe take this one while you're, <laughs> before you get your phone muted. Um, it's actually a comment that the, the date for bridge rails, uh, January 1st, 2019, uh, seems too early. Could you um, give some thoughts on that? Uh, currently, I think um, the, from the information we have, there's a couple of crash tested mass rails. Uh, and I think possibly when you uh, get the list and look at the uh, current list of mass rails that I think we'll produce later after this uh, webinar you'll get a better idea of uh, which systems are out there. Currently, the ones that have been crash tested, I think through TTI, were the uh, single slope 36-inch barrier that uh, several states have adopted already. But uh, I think there is a need for some other rails to be uh, tested through the testing centers. OK, we have actually some additional information about the, the earlier question about testing longitudinal barriers on slopes. Um, 
FHWA and Nick Artemovich is letting us know that W-beam guardrail is essentially limited to 10 to 1 slopes and very little testing has been done on the MASH 2009 that would have to be repeated using the MASH 2015 criteria. Um, and then another comment about the list of MASH um, uh, uh, systems that meet MASH that was distributed uh, prior to the webinar. Um, the longitudinal barriers, um, one item is missing, the Gregory Mini Spacer, NuGuard 31. Um, that's good information. If anybody else sees that list and sees other things that are missing, um, please send that along to us and we'll um, work on getting that up, up to date. We had um, uh, a couple of folks at FHWA went through um, quite a bit of effort to get that list pulled together. So. Um, you know, in time for the webinar for us, so if we will plan on keep editing that and, and the other files we sent out um, after this webinar to address, you know, the additional questions that people have asked here. Um, and so we'll be able to, uh, um, to get more information out people in writing. Um, there's a question about the chart that was attached to the, the files we sent out earlier. It was, um, I think that is the, I can't look at it while I'm on this computer doing something. So the, um, the attachment three, I think it's the list of the, uh, of the MASH approved, uh, sorry, not approved, but the, the, the devices that have met the MASH criteria. Um, Keith, could you all talk about the, just explain that list? Sure, Ken. Um, the attachment three that was uh, sent out with the background uh, white paper uh, basically included a series of, of systems um, based upon category of the system, uh, longitudinal barriers, uh, permanent concrete barriers, and transitions. This is a database from the Federal Highway Data Data Center uh, for eligibility determination, um, and and uh, it also makes reference to the eligibility letter that uh, that is uh, currently on file. Um, as Kelly indicated, as, as we become aware of, of other systems that we need to add to this list, we certainly would make those changes and, and provide this update um, for, for uh, the users. Okay. Um, there's a, there are two pooled fund projects that are um, uh, developing hardware, and th those are open for additional states to join. Um, that is, FHWA is asking if other states would be interested in developing that. So if um, we have contact information we'll put here on the end if you'd like more information about those pooled funds, if um, uh, you aren't aware of them, uh, contact us and we can put you in touch with the uh, right people to get more information about them. But um, basically, that would be one way to help develop more uh, generic bridge railings that meet the MASH crest, uh, test criteria. The next question is um, kind of further comments about the, the, the 2019 date for bridge railings uh, because there are um, many different bridge rail types that states uh, can choose from and um, kind of the level of effort it uh, takes, the level of funding and effort it takes to get the bridge rails crash tested. And then um, to get the, um, the contracts written and, and, and the rail um, built. And so the um, comment is basically that there's um, only a, a small number of, there's a small number of bridge rails that are patching mass and is not going to meet uh, state's needs to address uh, contact sensitive solutions. Um, so more Keith and Paul on on that, and I think um, you know we can feed into the TCRS discussion in a couple weeks as well, possibly. Uh, on Keith. the bridge rails, I think that was a good comment made previously about uh, getting involved with some of the pool fund groups. Uh, I know our state's involved with the uh, uh, pool fund group through TTI, and the state of Washington uh, chairs that pool fund group, and we're, we're always interested in getting additional states involved in our pool fund group. So that's one way to, to uh, get some of the newer bridge rails tested. I will make the comment that even though the uh, 
mass test on a 32 inch bridge rail failed, it still is good, as far as I know, for a test level three application that can be used, uh, but not test level four. And as to the um, question relative to the January 1st, 2019 date for the uh, for the sunsetting uh, for bridge rail uh, special interest, the again the implementation agreement is a living document. Um, it would be the intent of the TCRS to monitor monitor the progress uh, that we see out there relative to the roadside safety industry and what is coming forward and what the needs are. Um, we do recognize that under the pool fund states that they have a little bit uh, faster approach to implementing uh, research requirements and, and contracts than trying to process through the NCHRP research program. Um, but uh, certainly if, if we're finding that we have certain categories of systems that, that we're still struggling with, I am pretty confident that the TCRS with, with the uh, assistance of subcommittee and design will re-review those, those dates and determine whether there's anything that needs to be adjusted. All right, the next question uh, is, for the project on the NHS, is it expected that FHWA would be able to provide funding assistance to the states uh, upgrading the pre-350 hardware, and then in the future, the uh, upgrading the 350 systems to MASH uh, approved systems? That's a, uh, you. <laughs> that's a very, uh, very interesting question. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, members of TCRS and state agencies, uh, I don't think we can answer that question. That certainly would fall back to Federal Highway Administration, um, and that of course falls in with the uh, with the uh, funding program for the for the national highway system itself. Um, but we certainly do recognize that uh, bringing forward uh, higher performing barrier systems, uh, uh, crash crash systems on our highways, uh, may result in a in a slight um, increase in cost, but the bigger question is: Is that cost worth the uh, price that we're we're will be re will be trying to achieve with the better systems on the roadway? Um, so, for questions related to the that hardware list that's in the attachment three that we sent out, um, the best. Folks at FHWA to address questions about that too would be Nick Artemovich and Will Longstreet. We can um, send their contact information out when we send the rest of this follow-up information out. Um, but we um, kind of related to the last question, we can also um, get try to get some more input from FHWA to address those kinds of questions in that background paper that we sent out as well. Um, there's another question. Uh, will the remaining letters from FHWA be available so that we know what other devices have been tested successfully? Keith, do you want to? We, we certainly have the uh, Appendix 3 within the, the, the white paper uh, showing devices that have the, the uh, letter um, for eligibility already in place. Um, as, as Kelly has indicated earlier, um, in our discussions with our tests, with the test uh, crash test facilities that, um, that we deal with, uh, we know that there are other systems out there that have been crash tested under MASH, uh, but they may be awaiting eligibility determination by uh, review through Federal Highway Safety Office. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, confident that that will be a, a question and topic of, of uh, discussion at our meeting next week uh, as we have further discussion with Federal Highway Administration um, and um, we certainly are interested in, in trying to move forward as fast as we can the systems that we do have available for the users. Okay, sorry. A ghost just came in and moved stuff around, so I got to figure out where we were. So, um, there's also some devices that were uh, some systems that were tested as part of NCHRP projects 
that don't have an eligibility letter, and so uh, we have a suggestion to add some of those to that table. Um, the states that uh, use BoxBeam and some of the other systems, we'll see those in there. Um, if a okay, if a guardrail connected to a bridge rail needs to be replaced after the implementation date, which is 2018 for guardrail and the 2019 for bridge rail. Does the bridge rail need to be replaced with a MASH 2015 compliant system? Uh, this is Keith. Uh, answer that on the basis that, again, that would fall under what the agency's policies and guidance would be. Um, we're looking to have certainly the, the agency themselves determine what level of investment they want to uh, the fields needed in order to address, address the, the uh, situation itself. Um, so again, uh, it, it's not specifically saying you have to, but it's basically saying that if it's the guidance that your agency provides, then it's encouraged. Okay, there was a question about having a, whether we have a similar list of NCHRP 350 or MASH 2009 uh, systems that have failed. Um, there was discussion on the W beam, but it would be helpful to have a reference for what has failed and what hasn't. Um, I don't think we'd have any information from the proprietary side about what failed, but we can uh, look for information on some of the generic devices that have been tested. Keith, do you have any anything to? Um, certainly, we we can look at the um, NCHRP. Um, Remember the project? We, we did, uh, we went through, through two uh, NCHRP project studies to look at uh, assessment of the existing, existing hardwares. Uh, we certainly could look through those reports and determine which ones was, was flagged as, as failures on that. My, my recollection is certainly the uh, the uh, strong post W beam guide rail uh, with the one of the pickup pickup systems that was used, uh, as well as the TL4 and the concrete were, were two of the major ones that came forward. Um, but we certainly can see if we can add a list, add to the list of those systems that did not do well. Okay, here's a another question: Did both the New Jersey shape and F shape 33-inch concrete bridge railing fail for TL4. The assessment crash, the crash test assessment that we completed was actually on the New Jersey, New Jersey shape barrier uh, uh, for the TL4. Um, it, through our discussions with the research experts, uh, it's felt that that the probable uh, end result will be the same for any other system that is at the 32-inch uh, 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 height. Um, basically, it was coming to the conclusion that the, the concrete barrier was just too short for the, the uh, single unit truck at the slight increased speed as well as the, as the slight increase in ballast. Again, I'll throw something in there, as Paul Fo said, again for the TL4 uh, test level. Okay, um, and a little bit of additional information from FHWA. Uh, first, the cost of safety hardware is eligible for funding as part of a federal aid project. Um, and we can also uh, get a list of the eligibility letters to be able to, to, to send to all the participants. Um, lists of the link, links to those letters. And then the research result, the research results digest number 349 uh, is on the TTI testing to MASH. So that is, um, it lists the tests run on the 350 devices that were tested to MASH and lists whether they passed or failed. Um, so we can, we'll kind of capture all these questions and answers to distribute to people as well. The um, Another question for a barrier that passed 350 at test level four and is at least 
36 inches tall, is a crash test necessary or can an eligibility letter be generated based on finite element model? Uh, that's a very interesting and difficult question to answer at, uh, at this stage. Um, certainly we would need to have some dialogue with our partners at the Federal Highway Safety Office. Um, but certainly if they have a, if the uh, questionnaire can, uh, can provide a little bit more detail on that, um, uh, we certainly would like to uh, explore uh, an answer to that question. Okay, so that is the end of the list of questions and comments. So, um, so what we will do is follow up with the information we've said we will send out. We um, have been making a list here. What we'll do is follow up with the with the slides and you know those original files we sent out and the recording of the webinar. Soon we will not. Um, we'll work on getting answers to the questions. You know, edit that uh, white paper, that background paper, to get the answers out to you. Um, but we do need to contact uh, FHWA and a couple others, maybe, to get some of those answers. So for now, we'll just send out the um, redistribute that same version we have. And then there were a few um, links and things we can try to get out as well. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed somebody. There's a question here. I'm going to try to. See if I can unmute. So, Dave Vizuga, you have a question. Um, you need to enter your audio pin in order to be able to ask the question verbally. So, you would need to hit pound, one, two, one, pound, in order to ask the question verbally. Otherwise, um, if you could type your question into the chat box, that would work. Um, while David is doing that, I will just mention this contact information is up on the screen. Uh, Keith is the chair of the Technical Committee on Roadside Safety. Um, for additional questions, you can contact him or basically the, the ASHTO staff for all the committees that this webinar invitation was distributed to. You can just send questions back through us and we can get answers from the appropriate people as well. So whatever is easiest, if you, uh, you know there's somebody from ASHTO that you get lots of emails to committee from uh, pretty uh, regularly. Just go ahead and contact them or uh, there's Keith here also. Uh, David, did you get in? I don't know what they do. All right, David, can you, are you unmuted? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah, I'm uh, Dave Bazinga, New Jersey DOT. I just had some comments. And uh, just to save myself from typing, but um, on on this discussion that we're having today, um, back in 2007, New Jersey did a study just to find out how we did a safety audit of fatalities and injuries involving guide rail in New Jersey just to see how we're doing after all these years. And we have a mix of guide rail at the time dating all the way back to pre-230 where we had the evil rectangular washers on the posts. But uh, based on that, um, in New Jersey there was approximately 10,000 vehicle occupants, 27 per day, that were exposed to guide rail impacts. And uh, crashes which guide rail was the most harmful object struck, approximately 10 to 12 persons were fatally injured and 100 persons received incapacitating injuries. And approximately 40 crash, fatal crashes involved a guide rail impact of some nature. Uh, the bottom line was New Jersey, in New Jersey, guide rail crashes fortunately resulted in only a small fraction of New Jersey highway deaths, uh, less than 1.5%. And you had a 75% chance when you were in a guide rail crash that you will suffer no injuries. So even with this large mix of guide rail, even dating back to pre-230 guide rail, it was pretty safe, the guide rail that we have out there. With that said, then um, when I looked at the historical review for the documents, for the crash tests, um, 
they were missing two, NCHRP 350-115 and NCHRP 3, uh, excuse me, NCHRP number 115 and number 118. And um, what happens is if you look at all the crash tests, we're, we seem to be chasing our tail as far as the weight of the vehicles for small and large. So if I, just to give you an example, in 62 was 4,400 pound car, in 71 we went from 4,000 to 5,000 pound cars, 72 was 4,500, then in 93 we switched to 4,400, in 2009 we're back to 5,000 which was what we were in in 1971. You look at the small cars. In 72, we started with the 2,000 pound small car. 74, we went to 2250. Then in 81, we went down to 1800. Then back in 2009, we're back to 2420 again, which is similar to what we had in 74. So as far as it comes down to is what size car are you going to hit the guide rail? What size car are you driving? If you're driving a uh, car that's 22, uh, excuse me, 1,800 pounds, hey, it'll work for 230. If you hit the guide rail with a 1,800-pound car, like I said, also work for 350. It may not work for, you know, um, a, a, a mesh type device. But what I'm getting to is we seem to be every couple of years changing the weights and then running around like nuts to try and get a system that works with the different size vehicles. You know, in three years from now and five years from now, are you going to change the weights again and then start this whole process? So from looking at this study we did in 2007, I'm trying to conclude here is we found that over half of all fatal guide rail collisions involved a secondary event, either a second impact or a rollover. Many of these secondary events were trees, poles, and rollovers. So you can cut down the rare fatal accidents for guide rail by 50% if you have a roadside recovery area, and we implemented that in New Jersey. We have details to make sure um, that we have a decent roadside recovery area at our new guide rail installations. The other thing, you can cut another 14% of all guide rail fatalities uh, for rollover, which you can cure with grading. So with proper grading and proper recovery area, you can cut your fatals by 64%, which to me is a lot more sense than right now um, sunsetting the, the, the mesh. Um, the other thing that's nice with the NCHRP 350 is we have some choices. If I could, as far as bridge transitions, uh, our bridge transition for MASH 350 was about 18, 19 feet long. Um, the new 31 inch system bridge transition is 37 and a half feet long. Right now, we're working on implementing to a 31-inch system, the Midwest um, system. But it's nice right now that I have a choice. If I can't fit the 37-inch, 37-foot-long transition, I can I can still use an NCHRP 350 18-foot transition that I have. You know, um, the other thing that we were person had asked about funding. Um, when we went from 230 to 350, we also said we weren't going to do the BCTs anymore. But because of funding um, or lack of funding, all the states are spending most of their money on paving and fixing their bridges. So I still have BCTs out on the roads that haven't been hit yet. I also have a lot of the pre-230 guide rail that's out there that has the uh, washers that doesn't let the uh, rail element properly um, release from the blockout. So I, I would be in okay. favor of, of, of sunsetting mesh if 
FHWA would pass a federal trust fund that would fund um, updating our guide rail. Because without that money, we're kidding ourselves. In five so if I, if I could interrupt for a second, we have to. Uh, we have a couple other hands raised. Uh, sure, Keith, sure. I'm sorry for taking so much time. Oh, I just wanted to make. Uh, no, it's it's good so discussion. I think when TCRS meets next week, they can work on uh, some of the or the week after some of the issues you discussed. It. Keith or um, Chris or the others, do you have anything you'd like to um, respond to, or do? You uh, just, just a couple couple of notes. I uh, certainly appreciate the, uh, the understanding that uh, New Jersey in 2007 did a did a uh, study um, on on their safety uh, for safety audit of the guardrail systems. Um, certainly would be interested in getting a copy of that if possible for the uh, technical committee to uh, ponder. Um, you are correct relative to the vehicle changes. Uh, we have been moving up and down based upon what the industry uh, provides out there. Uh, there's certainly not that cohesion between roadside safety hardware and the manufacturers of automobiles. Um, we've been seeing automobiles change, uh, but under the uh, MASH 2009, we do have a Appendix H procedure for test vehicle selection procedures. Uh, will it change in the future? Uh, it depends upon what the industry provides uh, and allows on the highway systems. Um, Performance of systems uh, that are out there that may be under 250 or even under 230, uh, certainly we have variations of, of impact conditions out there. Uh, some older systems will perform just fine under a, a lower impact speeds and lower angles, uh, but we, we just we do look at the crash test uh, information uh, systems in order to provide the the uh, highest performance systems for the for the worst worst practical op, uh, condition. Um, the um, uh, installation practices, I, I fully agree. Providing a good recovery area, uh, providing for good gradings to minimize rollovers, those are all essence of, of uh, the guidance that we try to bring forward in the roadside design guide. And I commend you for bring, putting that pract into practice. All right, thank you. I'm actually um, getting a couple questions about whether we lost audio. So I have a feeling that since we went Over. to 3 o'clock, that was when the webinar was scheduled to, we might be gone. Uh, um, there were two others who had, people who had their raised hand. If there's, oh, okay. If you, it sounds like we might still have audio. Um, so we can wrap up. There were two others who had their raised hands. If you could email um, email me the questions, I can get answers and responses back to you. Um, if they weren't uh, set up through the uh, the question pot already. So I think we'd like to thank everybody for joining today. We will follow up with the information we said we'd send out, and then TCRS is also going to take your comments and suggestions and discuss them at the meeting in a couple weeks and um, see if there's any uh, revisions that they want to make to the background paper implementation agreement and then we'll be able to get additional information back out to the other ASHTO committees uh, following that so that people have an update on the direction this is heading. Uh, Keith or Joyce uh, or any of the others, any, any last comments you'd like to make? Uh, this is Keith. Uh, sorry. I certainly want to uh, uh, extend appreciation for those who attended the uh, webinar, uh, become more informed. Uh, certainly, if you have any questions, please pass them forward. Um, and uh, certainly, the uh, we will be taking it under guidance and discussion at our, at our technical committee meeting.